I welcome Fred Turner to the HKW Talks on the Anthropocene. Uh, Fred Turner is professor in Stanford. Uh, he is associate professor for communication at Stanford University and at the same time director of Stanford University's program in the science and technology and society. Welcome, Fred. Thank you. Nice to be here, Ben. You wrote this wonderful book from counterculture to cyberculture, which to some extent describes through the perspective of California a development which was crucial for all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, how uh, did you develop this idea for this book? So the book, the book um, was a real surprise to me. Um, you know, the book is about how uh, a group of counterculturalists end up providing a utopian language for understanding computers as they enter our lives. And this w made no sense to me. Um, so, a little bit of background. I was a journalist for 10 years in Boston, and I wrote a book during that time about how Americans remembered the Vietnam War. Yeah. During the Vietnam era, computers were emblems of the Cold War military state. They were tools of the state. They were everything I thought the counterculture was protesting against. In 1996, I moved to California to attend graduate school, pursue a PhD. When I got to California, the internet was happening, and there was Wired Magazine promoting computers as tools of countercultural change. And there was Stuart Brand, who I had always thought of as a kind of countercultural hero, an anti-war hero, promoting computers. This made no sense to me at all. Um, and I started digging around. I started digging into Wired Magazine. Yeah. And as I dug into that world, I saw that many of the people who were promoting computers had in fact been part of the Whole Earth Catalog and its various connected yes. publications. The Whole Earth Catalog is, so to say, a crucial uh, theme in, in your book. Uh, Stuart Brandt is, so to say, the figure which, who mm -hmm. is going through the whole book. Uh, the Whole Earth Catalog, uh, let's go to this because when we started the Whole Earth uh, exhibition here at mm -hmm. the house, of course the Whole Earth Catalog was a reference point for this yeah. exhibition. And what I realized, at least in the German intellectual debate, the Whole Earth Catalog was not so well known. I mean, there were uh -huh. uh, a few people who really remembered uh, this, right. ca uh, this catalog. Whenever I encountered American intellectuals, uh, they directly uh, uh, knew what I'm speaking about. Um, so the whole Earth catalog, um, to speak about the whole Earth in, yeah. in the 60s was quite uh, a claim. Huh? Yeah. Uh, what is interesting is that the subtitle is, it's about tools. Yeah. So uh, studying uh, American pragmatism, mm -hmm. of course, uh, my idea, my first idea when I read this was, uh -huh. oh wow, here is a new kind of philosophy which relates to pragmatism uh -huh. and tries to develop a worldview via tools. Uh -huh. So this is so interesting to me because of course um, Germans may not know the catalog, but Germans from Germany you can see a kind of longer American history mm -hmm. that I think Americans are not necessarily aware of. Mm -hmm. If you ask Stuart Brand if he was a pragmatist, I think he'd sort of scratch his head and say, uh -huh. well, no. Um, pragmatism entered the whole earth world through Norbert Wiener and cybernetics. Okay. Stuart Brand and the hippies read cybernetic theory um, and Norbert Wiener uh, had absolutely engaged with um, pragmat pragmatists. But, but why did along. they read cybernetics uh, yeah. theory and uh, Wiener? I mean, Wiener was right. part of the military project in, right, right. in, in the 40s. Well, so this is something that surprised me when I started digging into the Stuart yeah. Brand world. I was always told that the counterculture of the 1960s was against mainstream America. Yes. So, and I was also told that it was one movement. In fact, I started doing my research, I actually found that there were two very distinct movements in the American counterculture. One, political, the new left, doing politics to change politics. And the other, the whole earth catalog world, um, not political at all. On the contrary, they believed that politics was bankrupt. And so, to, to build a new world, what you needed to do was turn toward consciousness, toward tools, toward changing mindsets. Yeah, could you explain a little bit what the role of, let's say, this ideology coming out of the Second World War of cybernetics yeah. played for this thinking? So uh, pa perhaps explain a little bit about cyber what is cybernetics and sure. how did it come about? So cybernetics evolved during World War II, during military research, and it evolved as two things at the same time. One, a, a scientific theory of how systems work and how agency works, and two, as a kind of language for collaboration. 
as science, it tried to explain how, um, how things could um, change their behavior by being in interaction and in relation with one another, by getting feedback and then changing behavior. Mm -hmm. As a social theory, it was a theory that allowed people from many different disciplines to collaborate together. Mm -hmm. And it was formed precisely in the World War II world of interdisciplinary collaboration. And I think what was interesting also for the later developments is it started to describe human uh, beings and machines as part of the same uh, milieu, setup absolutely. and milieu. And, what, and what, what, trans what moved between machines and people, what allowed them to communicate yeah. with one another was information. Yeah. So in the cybernetic theory, information syst everything is an information, information. system. Yeah. Organic, me yeah. mechanical, who cares? It's all information. But before we come to this uh, information point, because I think it's crucial to see, the, to see these historical references, is what I found interesting is that Wiener applied or developed this kind of theoretical approach really from uh, projects uh, of the military, from defense oh, very uh, projects. Right. Very, very, uh, perhaps very definitely. you can explain a little bit because it's very well uh, explained in your book. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so, so Wiener during World War II, um, like most scientists at MIT, was, was involved in trying to support military research and help the war effort. Yeah. He was particularly involved in developing radar or trying to develop radar. Um, and was not terribly successful, but during the war he developed something that he called an anti-aircraft predictor. So um, it was a challenge. You have aircraft flying overhead. You, need, you want to shoot them down, yes. but you have to predict where they're going so that you can shoot the ball up. Yes. This, this allowed Wiener to develop a systems view of the airplane and the predictor together. Yes. So the, the airplane pilot, the man down below, the airplane itself, the predicting machine were all part of a single system that he could understand yeah. as an exchange of information. And uh, uh, develop a mathematical theory about it. Absolutely. So uh, now we come to the 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, you started to explain why uh, Stuart Brand and uh, let's say the countercultural movement mm -hmm. took on this idea. Right. Uh, perhaps you explore that a little bit more. And what you also may explain is why was it uh, this movement of countercultural mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, of the countercultural movement? Why was this movement apolitical? Because yeah. in the term counterculture, it seems as if there is already a kind of critical political distancing right. from a uh, uh, major society. Right. So it was it was anti-political in a couple of senses. I think that Stuart Brand and his generation grew up with a fear that the world could be organized in a military-industrial manner, top-down, um, hierarchical. They didn't want to live in that world. And they didn't want to replicate that world as they tried to change it. And so they just turned away. They said, look, you know, forget it. That's what those people do. What we need to do instead is find some other way to be together outside politics. And what they turned to was science and business. Mm -hmm. Science, particularly military science, seemed to offer a theory of um, systems organization that was non-hierarchical. Mm -hmm. Each person could interact with every other person and get feedback. Mm -hmm. I'm okay, you're okay, as a book of the 70s mm -hmm. said. Mm -hmm. Everybody could interact. Mm -hmm. We could just share consciousness. Hierarchy would no longer be necessary. Bureaucracy would no longer be necessary. And I think here you can see a, begin of, a bit of the beginnings of neoliberalism. Yeah, Be but before we come yeah. to that, of course, uh, the way you describe uh, business relation is very much related to the non-hierarchical approaches of the hippies in, of in the countryside. Yeah. Uh, to some extent, also a movement which was apolitical. Well, it tried to be apolitical. What's, what's very, so I actually think something different happened on the communes. So from 1966 to 1973 is the largest wave of communal activity in all of American history. Yeah. Um, one very reputable publication estimated that as many as 7 million Americans okay. were, on com were on communes in this period. On communes, often people turned away from explicit rulemaking and turned toward consciousness, the sharing of consciousness mm -hmm. as a mode of organization. Mm -hmm. The problem was on communes, when they did that, um, they let go of all the ways that we have for negotiating the distribution of resources. They started relying on charisma and cool and social norms as organizational forces. Mm -hmm. These are, these are actually very pernicious. Mm -hmm. Communes turn out to be, many of them, not all, but many communes turn out to be socially conservative in an extreme degree. Mm -hmm. you know, really heterosexual, mm -hmm. men very much dominant over women during this period, yeah. um, racially segregated, all the things that mm -hmm. the suburbs mm -hmm. were supposed to 
Yeah, but cool. when the communes broke down at mm -hmm. the beginning of the 70s yeah. or mid 70s, uh, you dis just described that as really a major movement uh, in the United States. Yeah. And it was a movement by people who are the middle class. Very I mean, much middle class. Really the, the agents of uh, uh, so social change. Yeah. So how did this translate later on into society. Right. So the communes on the one hand were built on, uh, ev many people were reading cybernetics but also Buckminster Fuller, were built on an understanding of a kind of systems model of society. Mm -hmm. When that model broke down in the 60s and 70s, people needed to get jobs and they spread out into the world. But they retained with them both the sense of having failed and the hope that they might succeed again. Mm -hmm. And Stuart Brand in particular in the early 80s feels that way very acutely. He's been, he was a celebrity in the 60s. By the early 80s, nobody knows who he is outside California. Then the Hackers Conference comes along in 1984, mm -hmm. and computers seem to be coming into the picture. Stuart Brand helps organize one of these Hackers Conferences, and suddenly he sees in the computer world a place where the systems ethos and the utopian possibilities of the 60s might live again. Mm -hmm. He sees a new tool. Yeah, perhaps you can... Uh describe how he sees this relationship of, let's say, uh, approaches, strategies he used already in the catalog then in the di digital sure, world. Sure, sure. So I think of Stuart Brand in, the, in, a, in a very good way as a P.T. Barnum. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in a negative hustler yeah. sense at all. I mean, on the contrary, I mean it in a positive sense. Yeah. Stuart Brand is a network entrepreneur. He sees three or four different things going on around him mm -hmm. and creates a context, a catalog, a conference, an event mm -hmm. in which those people can come together. Very much like Norbert Wiener used to yes. gather up different kinds of scientists. Yes. When the computer world comes along in the early 80s for, for Brand, and he's been in touch with the computer scene for off and on all the way, but, but when the hacker conference comes, he reads a book by Stephen Levy that describes three generations of hackers. Mm -hmm. He says, oh, let's hold an event at which we bring those three generations together. Mm -hmm. So he rents a space near the city at an old uh, army fort. People gather for a weekend. He brings technical people, he brings hippies, and suddenly by the end of the weekend, the technical people are saying, yes, we are all about cultural liberation. Mm -hmm. And the hippies are saying, yes, we're all about technology. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, we start to have a utopian vision from the 60s mm -hmm. attached to mm -hmm. devices that were anything but utopian in the 60s. Mm -hmm. It's interesting be because the whole movement, because the, let's say, one major claim by cybernetics is this interrelatedness of machines and human mm -hmm. beings. Mm -hmm. The way uh, you narrate your book, it's also partly based on big subjects. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One could co even call them, you used even the term, heroes mm -hmm. of the development, um, which is going to some extent counter to the conceptual frame yeah. they were proclaiming. So they were proclaiming the interrelatedness of everything, but at the same time you have heroes who right. are uh, con controlling or at least stimulating the process. Yeah. So this is, a, this is part of the logic of the communes come back to bite me, I think. Mm -hmm. On the communes, the rhetoric was one of egalitarian systems. Mm -hmm. But the fact on the ground was what Orwell used to describe in the book Animal Farm mm -hmm. as, you know, some animals are just more equal than others. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, Lois Brand, Stuart Brand's first wife, yeah. told me that when they went to communes, um, she said, yeah, Stuart would go talk about important things with the men, and I would go with the women, and we would put bleach in the water so people didn't get sick. That, those distinctions were very real. Yeah. And the same, I think, is true in the history that I tell. I think it's a case where some folks really are more influential than others. But the mechanics of influence are different than we, than we might think. I do want to say one thing about heroes. Um, I tried very hard to write a book that took both sides of the story into account, both the systemic forces yeah. in people's lives and also their lives. I don't believe um, in heroes in the traditional narrative sense. Mm -hmm. um, Stuart Brand is incredibly important and influential. Um, but I wouldn't describe him as heroic in the sense that yeah. I, I think a biographer would have. I decided very clearly early on not to write a biography of Stuart Brand. Yeah, yeah. But, but when we look at this development from today and look mm -hmm. at theories uh, today about theorizing the human-man-machine uh, uh, relationship, mm -hmm. I think what is interesting is uh, a lot of these theories claim that by these developments, uh, this subjectivity mm -hmm. of human beings are 
put aside, so yeah. to say, yeah. are, are eroded. Yeah. And what I can see in your book, and it's partly also part of our exhibition, is of course it's not just the heroic uh, subject who, mm -hmm. uh, who is the major protagonist, but there is also still subjectivity. Oh, absolutely. Subjectivity and agency. And I think yeah. the idea that our agency is eroding yeah. is itself ideological. Okay. It's an idea promoted by those who are, are manufacturing and distributing yeah. computers to enhance their power. Okay. I, Interesting. I, I, yeah. I, yeah. This is deeply political. Okay. Okay. So, uh, in your book, as well as in the, in the exhibition, uh, there are several agents. Uh, one agent are the subjects. Uh -huh. uh, but there is another kind of agents, the big images, icons you yeah, can call interesting, them. Interesting. Perhaps you could explore the, the, the icon of the earth, mm -hmm. uh, which play, plays such an important role. It's on the right. front of the catalog. Right. So, so what role these icons played for this event? So I, I think the first thing we need to understand is, is, is about um, vernacular science in this period. You know, in America in the 1960s, the space program was everywhere, but in reality, very few people could participate in it. One of the things that Stuart Brand did was he looked for signs and symbols of elite scientific achievement and then imported them into the everyday lives of citizens. And the whole Earth was one of those things. He wanted a picture of the whole Earth because, uh, originally because he, well, okay, so he had had an acid vision. He, had a, he, he, was, he took LSD, went up on a rooftop in San Francisco after a Buckminster Fuller talk, and was looking out, and he thought he could see the curve of the Earth. And he began to ask himself, why don't we have a picture of the whole Earth yet? We have men in space. Right. And that launched his campaign to find this image. Um, for him, the image, I think, provided a visual icon of the kind of connectivity that he had begun to imagine through LSD, through consciousness change, and that frankly had been imagined during World, during world War II and after as a kind of um, world system for military management. Yeah. So he was trying to bring all that together, but he was also, I think, trying to borrow in some sense the legitimacy of the space program to legitimize new ways of living at the everyday level. What is interesting, if you see the whole historical context is that images which were based on technological developments really to some extent stimulated by the military became images which were used by the counter movements right. exactly in order to attack the institutions who produced these images. Well, so this, this I want to dispute a little bit. I don't think Stuart Brand attacked the military. Okay. I think the New Left attacked the military. Yeah. But Stuart Brand and the New Left were very different. I had a funny moment. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's, oh, so, uh, yes. okay, please go ahead. So, uh, uh, I had a funny moment do it when I was preparing the book, yeah, researching yeah. the book. I interviewed Todd Gitlin. Todd Gitlin is a, was a founder of SDS, and I told him that I was writing a book about Stuart Brand. And he's like, Stuart Brand, oh, I don't know. I interviewed Stuart Brand, and I said, well, I'd spoken to Todd Gitlin. I said, Todd Gitlin, I don't know. These were two quite different worlds yes, at the time. Yes. And, and I think we've forgotten that over time. Yeah. Um, Stuart Brand and his group embraced things that he learned. Brand was a veteran. Yes. has always been very proud of his military service yes. and has always seen the military as a very innovative space. No, uh, uh, when I make, uh, made this reference, I was not directly related to uh, Stuart Brand, mm -hmm. but for example, uh, to the ecological movement. Uh, very interesting, uh, yeah. which, which, of course, used these images in right. order to turn it against technological development. Right, that's right. And, but so the, so the, and it's such an interesting space, because I think what they turned against, and this would also still be true for Brand and his group, was big technology, Yes. but small technologies were still very powerful. Oh, right. Lifestyle technologies were still very much part yeah. of the picture. Yeah. So yeah, the military, large weapon systems, bad, yes. but LSD, stereos, music, yeah. electronic amplification, that's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, this whole project of the whole earth, um, with this reference to the history of California you are describing in your book, is taking place in our context in a big project which is called the Anthropocene. Mm -hmm. And one major aspect of Anthropocenic thinking mm -hmm. is a kind of thinking of wholeness. You mm -hmm. have to look at the Earth as a whole, as a whole system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is very much, of course, related to cybernetic yep. uh, culture. Now, looking back from today to this historical movement, how would you judge this conceptual approach, uh, approach of uh, dealing with wholeness in the cybernetic yeah. context. So I would, I, would, I would try to think about both the opportunities it offers and the challenges. Mm -hmm. in, in its opportunistic sense, it, it gives us a chance to imagine being connected to and responsible for 
things that we don't see as ordinarily part of our lives. Mm -hmm. It helps us think about the poor, it helps us think about people of different ethnicities and nationalities as like ourselves, and that's part of that universal humanistic vision of the 50s and 60s, very powerful, mm -hmm. and I think that might help us take action that's genuinely benevolent for the planet. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the systems view of the 1950s was also attached to a kind of managerial ethos, mm -hmm. a faith that if we just turn things over to experts, they would build systems, they would build containers, mm -hmm. and we could live our lives freely within that. Mm -hmm. If we follow that route, if we turn things over to experts mm -hmm. and don't take a kind of individual responsibility for our relation to the whole, um, then I think we're going to continue to be in very hot water, quite mm -hmm. literally. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's very difficult uh, on the one side, let's say, as an ordinary citizen, mm -hmm. uh, to take decisions on the basis of knowledge which, are produce, which is produced by experts. Right. 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 Well, th so here I think Stuart Brand offers a powerful lesson. Mm -hmm. You know, Stuart Brand was not part of the military establishment. He didn't know Norbert Wiener. But he was very good at recognizing and bringing together products from those worlds. Mm -hmm. Those products are still available to us now in our own time. Mm -hmm. How can we organize those? into missions that we see as more important. Mm -hmm. The da data on climate change is widely available. Mm -hmm. How can we organize that data and take action on that basis? Mm -hmm. We can build communities. We can build institutions. If I look back on this development, uh, there were moments where one had the impression that uh, building these tools mm -hmm. in itself is the meaningful process. Right, right. right. Uh, and not looking at the tools as instruments for Right, right. And in fact, in that period, it was explicitly an anti-instrumental view. Yes. Instrumentalism was what they were fighting against. That's hierarchy, yeah. that's bureaucracy. Uh, but, but that even fostered the, the approach to look at the tools right. as uh, meanings in themselves. Right. And this is the problem. This is one of the temptations. Yes. It, it's such a, a bourgeois ideal. Mm -hmm. You know, if I just get the right tool for my lifestyle, everything yes. will change in the world. Yes. Because my private world has changed, the world as a whole will change. Yes. You know, one of the phrases from the 60s that bothers me the most, I used to love it, now it just bothers me, is the personal is political. I think too often people take the personal as the only site of politics. Yes. That's a problem. I think we end off the, on this note. Great. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you so much for having no, me. No, no.